All right, I think we might get started. Um, so uh, my name is Robert Layton. I'll be chairing uh, this session, but I won't be doing much talking. I'll mainly be worrying about who the presenters are and who the question people are. Um, so first up, uh, we have uh, Oliver ne uh, Nagy. Um, he'll be talking, and um, Oliver works in a telecommunications startup, but uh, he'll be talking about something a bit different today. We will be talking about uh, scientific simulation as a game. Uh, without the cloud aspect, but uh, that's just uh, no bravery there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well done. Yeah, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Oliver, as you can see, and due to the introduction, and I've always wanted to be a rocket scientist. Unfortunately, I didn't become a rocket scientist, but it doesn't change the fact that I like the things that have rockets attached to them. <laughs> so when I see, for instance, when the NASA conducts a mission to explore Pluto, or when SpaceX is trying to build a rocket or a reusable rocket in order to cut the cost of space exploration by at least uh, one of magnitude, then that excites me. So I mean, it's a, it's a very impressive project, obviously, but the part that really gets me going here is how do all the control algorithms that control the systems work? So that's the aspect that I've always been most intrigued by. And it's not just for rocket science, obviously. It can be everything from a self-driving car or an airport baggage handling system. It's always a very complex system taking in all kinds of inputs, doing some kind of more or less smart processing, and then producing um, an output that hopefully makes the overall system behave in a reasonably rational way. The problem with that is that in order to learn that, in order to gain that skill so they can do one of those things, like building your own rocket, you need well, the rocket. And those toys are very expensive usually, and that's where it becomes difficult. So if you're in software engineering, for instance, software engineering is relatively easy in that regard, because the barrier to entry in software engineering is zero. All you need is a laptop, maybe an internet connection, you download the software you're interested in, which is almost certainly free these days, and maybe a tutorial, and then you're good to go. But if you want to do something that involves real hardware, especially in hardware like this, then the story is a bit different. Also, when software fails or sec faults, then that's fine. You can simply restart it. But if your rocket explodes, not so good. So the question is, how do you get there? How can you work on something like this? So my first step is probably you go to university, and you learn the basics, and that's fine, and you end up with quickly plot, plots. So you end up with something that shows something going from zero to four. In this case, it doesn't really matter what it is or how it works. It's just this is what you have. And that's fine, you have to learn how to walk before you learn how to run, obviously. And, and plot is free again, because it's software. So everything is good, but that's quite the staggering difference between producing a plot like this that shows something going to four, for instance, the rocket levitating to four meters above the ground and then gently setting down again, or the self-driving car increasing the distance to pedestrian by four meters. In, in principle, you can relate to that, but it's not quite the same thing. So it's very underwhelming if that's all you have and that's all you get at university. So the question was and still, how can I get a bit closer to building my rocket? <laughs> and a computer game came to mind because computer games, obviously, they simulate fairly complex worlds, very complex environments. They have cars and spaceships and in a sense they are self-driving or self-steering. And most of it is cheating, of course. So, because those cars and those spaceships, they follow some predefined path. They're not really subject to the laws of physics. And there are some, um, some exceptions, but the vast majority of games, that's not the case. And game engines also not built for that. So game engines are conceptually the right tool, as I said, because you would have your virtual environment. But the first and foremost purpose of a game engine is to entertain. So their purpose is to make a rich experience, to make it visually stunning, to give an immersive environment. And physics is important for that, obviously, but only to the point that it does not di distract from the game. It's no, there's really no point in having an accurate physics simulation because as a gamer you wouldn't know and wouldn't care. So you can spend your processing power somewhere else, obviously. So for the purpose of doing a scientific simulation, that's kind of not cutting it. And that's where I started to think about how could I get around this? And that's what I came up with, what I call an ASRAEL. So first up, ASRAEL, it is not a game engine. So I'm going to show a live demo, hopefully, in a few minutes. 
And it will look and feel a bit like a game, but it's not a game engine. So if you want to build a game, this is not the tool for you. The first, or the main purpose, at least for the time being of ASREL, is to simulate Newtonian physics. So to have an environment where you can define objects and have the laws of physics act upon them, most notably how forces and torques affect the objects. And that's usually a point where people come and ask, um, whom is it for? Or at least that's what happened in the past. And so I added an extra bullet point here. So it is really mostly for people who want to learn, like what I showed in the introductory video. So how would these complex systems work? How could you build one of those? So without having to build a complete game or without having to build all the simulation environment, how can it just get cracking on the algorithms that drive this whole thing? And that's really what it is for. So like a, a gamified version of the rocket. And that brings me to the live demo. So in the live demo, I'm going to show my spaceship. It's not very pretty, but it's mine, and it's free because it's software. So it's a simple cube. It has six thrusters, and I'm going to use that to make it occupy a certain position in space. And there are two parts to this demo. The first one is just to show you the principal workings of how you can interact with this engine. And the second part is giving a, a bit more of a complete demo on how that actually allows it to simulate something more complex. So, first thing up here is the ASRL in itself, it is not, it's not a module that you import, or it's not the monolithic program that you start, it's literally a small network of microservices. So the moment it all runs on my local machine, but all the services communicate exclusively via the network, so you can run that in the cloud and spread over as many computers as you want. And the interaction with ASRL is the same. It's purely based on a TCP connection, so wrapped via, either via HTTP or serial tube. So it should be possible to connect from pretty much any language. And one of the services that I've added in was a web viewer. So it's simply a web server that shows a 3D rendering of the scene in your browser. At the moment, there's nothing in the simulation. That's why you see nothing. And the first demo, as I said, I'm going to show very quick. Yeah. So PCB is for Bicom Brisbane, by the way. And so the basic interaction is as follows. So you usually instantiate a client that connects to Aswell, and then you can mm -hmm. issue certain commands. Those commands, you have to always pass a couple of arguments, but I'm not going to bore you with those arguments. So I've wrapped that client into yet another client, especially for this presentation. So we don't have to worry about arguments, but the principle is exactly like that. So you create a client and make it connect to the system. So that happened here. Then you have to have uh, defined an object, like the spaceship that I saw. I'm not going to do that. I have already done that beforehand, but once you have that available, you can simply spawn. And you get your whatever it is. So that's a, a simple cube, but the geometry is really arbitrary. So you can upload as, as complex an object as you want. And of course, you get the standard, some standard modification commands. So you can scale it if you want, or you can. Change the position, or you can also modify the geometries themselves. So in this case, there was simply a command that wraps the modification commands that add those three. Pardon? The web viewer? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the, the console, you mean? Yeah, the console. Ah, hang on, my bad. So how about that? OK, uh, sorry for that one. Okay, but that's really always happening. It's just a couple of predefined commands that are simply called set scale, set position, and set booster flame in this case, just to change the visual appearance. In this case, it gives a visual feedback of which thrusters are active. But it's purely visual. There are no thrusters actually active, so let's remove this one here again and actually turn on the thrusters. So. Another service that is running, has been running all the time already, is the rigid body physics engine. That would pick up all the objects in the scene and compute or progress them according to the laws of physics and the forces that 
x and x. And in this case, I simply apply a force to the thruster that points to the right in this case. And so now object slowly but surely will start to drift to the right. And now on the other side, and slowly but surely it will come to a standstill. So and that's really the basic commands that you need to already build a fairly complex demo. I hope so. That's the tricky part now. I've used exactly the commands I've just shown you to create this one. So it spawns two objects and it simply changes the scale every 100 milliseconds and every 10 seconds it changes, randomly changes the position. So these are simply markers in space and we're going to use as targets. So those targets could be, for instance, in the rocket where the rocket should levitate at a particular height or where your automatic car should move itself to or whatever your, your application demands. And of course, to make this here useful, Large enough? Yeah, looks like. Um, of course, that's just picked the wrong. Okay, here it is. So, um, so that was the spaceship that I had before with exactly the commands that I had before, and it randomly picked one of those two targets and is now following this target. But unlike in a computer game where they would be scripted, this here really uses a simple control algorithm in this case to activate its boosters and move them. It's not a very smart algorithm for the purpose of this talk here, but just to give you an idea. So you can now build your cubes and figure out whether you have a better way or a smarter or a faster or more efficient way to move that cube around. And of course, you can play that not just with one cube, but you can play that with as many cubes as you want because as you have noted for already that this one here is a, a separate terminal and this one down here was another terminal, so they're independent processes, so they don't have to run on the same machine. You could have the individual controllers really running on your own dedicated computer if your control, for instance, is very complicated and does require a lot of power, but not for this one here. So, uh, let's see if my shell foo is any good. Not very good. Uh, that's my typo. Yeah, but the, ah, would be good if you were in the right environment. And now we're in the wrong directory, so slowly we're getting there. Here we are. So now there are another five of those, so six in total, and they all have picked randomly a, couple, a target. Now, obviously, they are all trying to, or the two groups are trying to occupy the same position in space, which may or may not be desirable. Yeah? So if a couple of caps go to the same location, it would be good if they go to a similar location, but not quite the same one. And the other problem that you see is those groups interact with each other. So if you have one car going to one destination, and another car to another destination, then this is very fun to watch on the screen, and it reminds me very much of growing up with siblings, to be honest. But it is not the kind of stuff that you want to see in your self-driving car. You know, if it bumps around like in an autodrome, that's probably not the desired outcome. And it turns out now to build a system that makes those cube move to those targets without touching each other, that's already a considerably harder problem. In terms of simulating it with Astral, it's a trivial extension. So it, I simply spawned a couple of more cubes. It's exactly the same program as I showed you. But now you have to be considerably smarter with the algorithm. So if you want to go down the route of doing something with standard control theory, that's one option. Or maybe you want to go and use something from artificial intelligence or use your machine learning or deep learning like, the, like Tesla is trialing with their cars at the moment. You can really put anything that you want in there because Astral is taking care of the simulation. You just connect to it via the network and you can use whatever tool and as a matter of fact also whatever language you want in order to query that system and, make and act upon it. And they can make it more and more realistic. So for instance, instead of just querying the system for the position of the other cubes in order to avoid them, 
you could just query their position and render that into an image like I do here. So pretend that you have a camera on the object, basically. And if you do that, then you can use, say, image processing to figure out via image processing where those objects are, how they are moving, and use that as an input, which is probably a lot more realistic. We can gradually layer that up uh, further, make gra gradually layer it and make the, the simulation more and more complicated. And all the while, you can focus mostly on the underlying algorithms, which is the part that I enjoy doing most. So this, by the way, is, is the last demo. I have not written anything yet that um, acts in any smarter way, but I hope this will at least give you a bit of an idea what I'm trying to do with it and what it's supposed to be doing. As well itself is still, it's an infancy, but it's usable to a degree at least, as I hope you can see here. And it's actually also already the end of my talk. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any, uh, I still, 10 more seconds, yeah. Uh, so uh, code documentation is there, and again, the red is not very readable. I thought it would be better this time. So, um, that would be it, yeah, if you like it for whatever reason, I should probably point out that so no one is paying me to do that, so as my, sorry, he didn't get your name, it's very Robert. rude, Robert, yeah. Um, so as Robert pointed out, so it's not what I'm doing for, um, or it's not how I earn my money, so it's all in my spare time. So if you liked it for whatever reason and think it's cool for whatever reason, uh, please consider giving me a star on GitHub since it's pretty much the only currency I have for this one. Uh, I would very much appreciate it. Yeah. If you don't like it, don't give me a star. But if you do, maybe you can be bothered. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, any questions? How uh, how are uh, all? How did you build that ship in there? Uh, that code? ship, I went to a guy who know how to use Blender, and he built me that ship. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I am. And do you and do and do you use code to make it work? Yeah. Um, the, yeah, so that's all code. So everything that is all beyond the graphics, that's all code and algorithmic stuff, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so that was like very interesting. One of the things that I'm kind of interested in is the idea of like an autonomous robot or research into autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. So to what extent can you sort of like dive into one of those objects and get an object's eye view of the world, like put a camera or a sensor on it and see the world through the object's um, eyes? That's, that's trivial. So at the moment, all I do is I stand in a fixed position of space and render the scene from there. And in order to do it, I need to query the position for the objects anyway. So all you have to do is instead of query that instead of rendering from where I'm standing right now, you render it from wherever the object is. So uh, the, a trivial, uh, in principle, a trivial extension. Yeah, if you know JavaScript, yeah. <laughs> but my my JavaScript is not that good. Um, but uh, the rendering itself is very easy. So because all you have to define is your position in space, and then you see it from there. So I should. Oh, now you saw it, so I could actually move around through the scene. So there was, there was a live scene, yeah. Uh, hi, yeah, that was really interesting. Um, so you mentioned that you are got different parts of the, the whole package um, communicating over TCP. Mm -hmm. um, have you tested it on any sort of cloud environment? I mean, um, no, not yet. Um, to yeah. be honest, so I, it, there's a demo running on cloud, on the cloud right now, but not over multiple computers. So it's still yeah. all on the same computer. So I have not done any performance tweaking or anything at all. So because yeah. originally I was, when I started, I was very preoccupied with yes, we all load latency yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, um, and I never got anywhere. So the yeah. third time around that I started, I first make it work and then I make it fast. Um, but it turns out it works surprisingly well. So even though the web browser is very dumb, so it does it hammers the server as fast as it can to get new updates. And for, so I'm in Melbourne and hitting up, hitting on an instance in, in Sydney on an AWS, um, I get very smooth animation for around, I think, 20 objects that, that are moving around in the scene. Okay, thanks. Uh, you said, it <coughs> you said it was a Newtonian physics simulator. Uh, what? elements of Newtonian physics have you simulated? Like, like, how do you set mass or thrust or fuel? Or is there any, like, w to what yeah. extent? Um, to 
to the exact extent that Bullet does it. So um, I'm not, I have not written my own one because there's no shortage of physics engines out there. So I'm using the Bullet engine, simply wrapped with Cyton and incorporated it there. So everything that the uh, almost latest version of Bullet does, this one can do as well. Okay. Uh, any further questions? That's one more. I'm just wondering, uh, what's, uh, what's the uh, theoretical um, max uh, threads that you can run through it? So uh, uh, It doesn't run any threads at all. So there is, there's a database that serves as the collective memory. Yeah. And all the other services are purely stateless communicating via the database. So it's basically whatever the database can cope with works. Yeah, cool. Um, I've got a question. Uh, where do you see the next six to 12 months of uh, this project going? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that, that, depends, uh, that depends on how busy I'm in the job that pays me. Yeah? Um, <laughs> so it's, it's lately I have been very busy. I'm hoping to make a few more performance um, improvements and have a proper simulation running on, on the cloud distributed. So that's on pretty much high on, on, my, on my list in, in Trello. And beyond that, I would like to have a few more, something that's a bit more punchy in terms of demo, because the graphics is very simplistic and it's, it's possible to get more you know, fancy objects and fancy lightning, but I'm, I'm not a JavaScript guy, you know, for me it's always a pain in the bum to, to work with that one. So I put it off for as long as I could. So that's probably a bit more in terms of polish. And beyond that, I personally simply like to use it to experiment a bit more with the algorithms but probably also to have a few more um, physics components in it that they would usually not have. Yeah. But that's a bit too speculative at the moment. Okay, great. All right, uh, so thank you. Thank you very much.